silence grew and became intense, wider and deeper. The brain which had listened to the silence of the hills, fields and groves was itself now silent. It had become quiet, naturally, without any enforcement. It was still, deep within itself. Like a bird that folds its wings, it had folded upon itself. It had entered into depths which were beyond itself. It was a dimension which the brain could not capture or understand. And there was no observer witnessing this depth. Every part of one's whole being was alert, sensitive, but intensely still. This new, this depth, was expanding, exploding, going away, developing in its own explosions, out of time, and beyond space. The first time I really met him was in Brockwood, the first, my first year in a student meeting. And there was, it made me, it made me shocked to see this 90 years old man just walking in and really frail. I mean, he was frail and it was strange to see him like that. I mean, he was very old. And he sat down and he was very innocent, you know. He looked around and looked at us, smiled at us. But you didn't know, I mean, I, would, I didn't see intelligence as I knew it, you know, knowledge. And when he started talking, we questioned him first a lot, you know, when he was a student. We questioned him and he, was re he got involved, quite involved, very involved in what he's saying. And there you couldn't see the old man at all. He was so fresh, so young, so in charge of everything, aware of us, yeah, aware. And in talking to him, I was 14, he was 19, but I was older than him, I was stuck. He was so young and fresh, yeah. And the talk end, and there again was the old man who forgot everything he had talked about. The mystic is a man who perceives directly. And St. John of the Cross, one of the great exemplars of this tradition, had a beautifully clear image. He said, if, if I have my hand in front of my eyes, I cannot see the sun. If I have an image of God, I cannot see God. And it's as simple as that. So in this sense, Krishnamurti was a, was a mystic. Krishnaji, perhaps for the first time in the spiritual evolution of mankind, uh, is one who denies, who negates the role and the authority and the aura that goes with the Guru. And uh, perhaps that uh, marks him uh, a distinct place in the whole uh, uh, history of spiritual quests uh, around the world. I will give you the tools to help you grow up, to be responsible for your actions and your way of living. And that is really exactly what he did. He just said, your greed, your fears, your selfishness, your angers and aggression, all of those are stopping you from receiving all this incredible world. So take a journey inside and find out about yourself and grow up. What we are trying in all these discussions and talks here is to see if we cannot radically bring about a transformation of the mind not accept things as they are, nor revolt against it. Revolt doesn't answer a thing. But to understand it, to go into it, to examine it, give your heart and your mind with everything that you have to find out, a way of living differently. But that depends on you and not somebody else. Because in this there is no teacher, no pupil, there is no guru. You yourself are the teacher and the 
pupil, you are the master, you are the guru, you are the leader, you are everything. The speaker is Krishnamurti. That noise of a motor. He is a man who cannot be placed in a simple category like philosopher or religious leader. He is, however, one of the more challenging and creative men of our time. This is the first of eight half-hour programs and the first time that Krishnamurti has allowed his talks and private conversations to be filmed. When you put that question, because you are serious, because you are intent, then you are aware of the whole process of the observer. which means you are totally attentive, you completely attentive. And in that attention there is no border created by the center. Hmm? And when there is complete attention there is no observer. Huh? The observer comes into being only when in that look there is inattention, which is distraction. We have put away the observer and therefore there is attention from it last a second, that's good enough, don't be greedy to have more. In that greed to have more, you have already created the center. And then you are caught. In that attention, there is no seeking at all, and therefore there is no effort. So the mind becomes extraordinarily alert. Silent. Such a mind is the religious mind, and such a mind has an activity totally different, at a different dimension, which thought can never possibly reach. It was a late summer afternoon. Near the shore, a group of children were playing. One of the boys, though ragged and undernourished, stood apart from the others. He was described as having a special radiance. A pure and shining atmosphere surrounded him. Because of these qualities, the child was singled out and chosen to be the vehicle for the coming world teacher. This discovery was not an isolated revelation, for it was believed that humanity was entering a new age, an age that would bring with it a new Messiah. During the early decades of the 19th century, science was beginning to replace religion as the savior of humanity. As the monolithic church splintered, new organizations emerged, offering a balance between science and religion. One of the many new groups, the Theosophical Society, spread rapidly throughout the world. Founded by Russian-born Helena Petrovna Blavatsky and the American Henry Steele Alcott, its objectives were to seek truth in the ancient religions of the East, to investigate the unexplained laws of nature, and to promote universal brotherhood. So attractive were these ideals that by 1881 the society had become a worldwide institution with over 100,000 enthusiastic members. The, the Theosophical Society, which was founded by Madame Blavatsky and Colonel Olcott, was really a ecumenical movement to show that all religions were equal. I mean, that was the um, basis of it which most people joined. There was also an esoteric side of it, which Madame Levesque worked out, saying that a 
a great hierarchical figure called the Lord Maitreya came to earth about every 2,000 years and took the body of a human being when they were most needed for the evolution of humanity. Mrs. Annie Besant became the president of the Theosophical Society after Colonel Olcott's death. And then she started looking very seriously with her colleague, C.W. Leadbeater, for a vehicle uh, who they thought would be suitable for the world teacher. Uh, the boy who was eventually chosen to be the Messiah was an Indian boy from South India called Krishna, Jiddu Krishnamurti. And they used to, he and his brother and um, other boys used to play on the beach every afternoon because Adya is on the sea. And one day Leadbeater saw this boy on the beach and he was tremendously struck by his aura. And he said this aura had not one trace of selfishness in it. And he immediately felt that this was the boy. I arrived in Adya in 1909, in August. And within a few days of my arrival, I met Mr. C. W. Leadbeater. And almost immediately, he introduced me to two Indian boys, J. Krishnamurti and his little brother of uh, Nityanand. Krishnamurti was shy, reserved, mystically inclined, seemingly outwardly to be rather dull and not, and not uh, quick on the uptake. Whereas his little brother sparkled with intelligence. They were in poor condition, very poor condition. And Leadbeater said, we have been, we have a task. Uh, and when Annie Besant arrives in India, she will help. CWL and Dr. Besant were corresponding about the older boy, K. By then, they had taken the boys to the master and the master apparently, according to them, said, that is the boy. So they, they had received, they said, instructions from their respective masters that K was going to be the vehicle for the world teacher. And so Leadbeater, CW, took charge of training these two boys. Nobody was to touch. Anything that K touched, if they said they liked oranges, for the rest of the year they had oranges. If they said they liked porridge, they had porridge every morning for the rest of the year. If they said they wanted to go on a, on a bicycle ride, right. You went on a bicycle for the rest of the year, every morning from seven to eight. So the boys never said after that they liked anything. There was a sense of tremendous feeling about all this, not just an intellectual concept, an intellectual invention, but a feeling that a great event, great thing around this boy. People were talking around the boy, all the theosophical things, theosophical jargon about um, discipleship and uh, the, how the Master treated the disciples and so on and on. All that went round him all the time, not just for a few days or a few weeks, all the time. And no, apparently nothing of that entered into the ball. He, he said he saw the Masters then. 
so on. He was highly, probably sensitive, uh, somewhat perceptive, clairvoyant and all that, because he used to see all kinds of things. All that in no way seemed to touch the boy, which is quite strange. See, my difficulty is now that I don't remember what he was like. I wish I could. I've thought a great deal about it, but I can't. I actually don't remember when I met CWL, Dr. Besant, about any of those things. And Mrs. Besant's idea was that this boy should be trained and educated in England for this tremendous role. And the following year, she founded a thing called the Order of the Star in the East. And she was the protector with Leadbeater. They were the two protectors of the order. And Krishnamurti was made the head of it. And the following year, she took him to England to be educated, and he remained in England until right up to 1920. He was taken to Europe, lived with people who are so-called British aristocracy, butlers, yacht, clothes, you follow? Servants, Rolls Royces, never smoked, never drank. Girls used to come round him, didn't know what it was all about. And so there was this peculiar state of mind which could not be held in a pattern. And they had put him at the head of an organization, Order of the Star in the East, where he was literally worshipped. And he used to shrink from all that. He was vague. He would tell everybody, I'll do whatever you want. That used to be his favorite phrase, I'll do what you want. Even now sometimes it happens. Of course the object of the Order of the Star in the East was to spread the gospel, so to speak, to prepare people, um, to prepare themselves to become disciples of the Lord when He came. And that might be 20 years, 30 years, 50 years' time. And um, so there was a tremendous surge of interest in this. And people absolutely flocked, theosophists and non-theosophists, to join this order. And the word was spread all around the Theosophical Lodges, all around the world, because it was a worldwide movement. Um, and it became, it became a very, very, very great, great thing. In 1921, Mrs. Besant, who was then in India, felt that Krishna had been educated enough, and that it was time that he started speaking, lecturing, for the society and for the order of the star, because they were joined, they were one. Really. And so she sent for him to come back to India. And by that time, he was thoroughly disillusioned with his role as Messiah. He didn't believe any of it, and he was terribly unhappy. And also what it added to his unhappiness was that his beloved brother, Nitya, had contracted tuberculosis, but he had been to Switzerland and he was pronounced cured. And so the two of them went off together in November of that year. Um, on their way to Europe, they stopped in San Francisco, where they were lent a cottage in the Ojai Valley from there. They were told it was a marvelous um, climate for tuberculosis. And it was the first time in their lives these two boys, these two brothers who were still very young, had been alone. And quite suddenly, they felt this tremendous warmth and happiness. And I think it was out of that happiness for the first time that in August of that year, Krishnamurti went through an ex 
completely unexpected, really, um, transformation, one might almost call it. A terrific uh, psychic or spiritual experience, which changed him, and changed him fundamentally, and found something which people, I suppose, have always, always search one of these marvelous transcendental experiences and really he kept it i would say for the rest of his life and he was in fact from that moment a changed being and my mother who heard of this he wrote to other people wonderful accounts of it wrote to other people saying isn't it wonderful that krishna is happy and has found himself at last After that amazing experience, Krishnamurti was perfectly happy to go on with his role of training himself, really, being trained as a vehicle for the Lord Maitreya. But then, quite suddenly, Nitya had a very bad relapse and was very, very ill again. And Mrs. Besant wanted uh, Krishna to go to um, Adya um, for the Jubilee Convention in 1925, and, uh, because it was important he should be there in his role. And he didn't want to go because Nitya was so ill. But he was promised by all the leaders, including Ledbita and um, Mrs. Besant, that Nitya was much too valuable to die, and that Nitya would not die, he would recover. And because of that promise, which he believed, Krishna agreed to go to India that year, leaving Nitya very ill, well looked after, very ill in Ohio. And on the voyage out, in fact, when he got as far as Port Said, India, he had a telegram saying Nitya died. And this was an absolutely shattering blow to him. He never believed it could happen. And it destroyed his faith very largely in the masters, who were part of the hierarchy of theosophy, who, who promised this through the clairvoyant people like Ledbita, and he was absolutely distraught by this and he said he had now suffered he now knew what death was and he knew now that there was a love that transcended death and that it was no longer the death of someone was no longer to be feared when the brother died you know I was here we left and I didn't know he was going to die. When I got to England, they said, we are the disciples. Huh? If you accept us, your brother will live. And when he died, he said, what a joke this is. <laughs> this is the phrase he used. After that, for another couple of years, he still believed in the Lord Maitreya and that he was, and he said at that time, the Lord will come more and more often. It wasn't a question that he'd taken possession, but the Lord would come more often to him, but it would still be the Lord speaking through him. But all this time, I think something was going on in his own mind. He was, he was searching for something himself. But as late as 1927, 
Mrs. Besant declared in America to the press, the world teacher is here. And, but it was after 1927 that he gradually began to feel that none of, none of this was, was true or right, that he had to go his own way. But he had to go very gently so as not to hurt Mrs. Besson, because he, he loved her dearly. And so there was a tremendously close relationship between them. And so it was a very, very difficult time in his life, because he knew that all the leaders, everyone, was against him. In 1929, in Holland, one of these annual, big annual camps he used to hold, and had for several years, he announced at a meeting that he, he was the head of the Order of the Star and he was going to dissolve it. And he said that it was quite unnecessary to have such an order, such an organization. He said that it was ridiculous, I mean, the gist of what he said, I'm not quoting him at all, to be told how spiritual you were. Only you knew whether you were corrupt or not corrupt inside. Nobody could tell you. And that his only object in life from then would be to set men absolutely free to discover truth for themselves and not to be told what truth was or be led in any way. They had to, they had to find it, if they wanted to find it for themselves and he was going to help them to be free. I maintain that truth is a pathless land and cannot be approached by any path whatsoever, by any religion, by any sect. Truth being limitless, unconditioned, unapproachable by any path whatsoever, cannot be organized, nor should any organization be formed to lead or coerce people along any particular path. If you do, it becomes a creed, a sect, a religion to be imposed on others. No man from outside can make you free. Therefore, I am not concerning myself with the founding of religions or new sects or the establishment of new theories or new philosophies. On the contrary, I am concerning myself with the only one essential thing, the true freedom of man. My desire is that men should be unconditionally free, to make the mind and the heart of man free from limitation, free from corruption, is happiness, liberation, and truth. So you want to know now what he thinks of the bold teacher, right? You were brought up in the very center and the thick of it all. What is your answer? I really don't know. He has never said, Who am I? He has never said, Is the world teacher true or not true? Is this question relevant at all? What is relevant are the teachings. Who the teacher is not relevant. But to investigate who the teacher is, we have to find out if you can grasp the quality of mind of the teacher. I personally I feel it's something so immense mm -hmm. that the brain saying, well, I'm going to find out, can't find out. But there is something extraordinary which happens, which shows, which occurs, which which gives hints and, you know, opens the door. And that I, after that, I, I don't want even to open the door to say, what is all this? I don't, no, 
I don't think the brain can understand it. If you were listening to Krishna Ji, he was not a guru. If you were accepting what he was saying, he was a guru. So the fact of whether he was a guru was or not did not lie with Krishna Ji. It lay in the audience who listened. Of all the Zen sayings, the one that I find most interesting is the saying, if you see Buddha, kill him, destroy him. And this is a very profound statement that if you take a man and venerate him as a god, then in that veneration all possibility of reality, of sartori, of enlightenment will disappear. And so if you see Buddha, you are seeing an illusion, get rid of it quickly. Are you interested in all this? What do you consider is life? Your life, what is your life? What is that life that you daily live? Dependence, attachment, pain, annoyance, anger, irritation, sorrow. You know all this, don't you? This is your daily life. Going to the temple and doing some kind of noise with the bell and doing puja, doing yoga. That we say that is our life. Then what do you mean by a religious life? You tell me, what does religion mean to you? The word, the word religion means to gather all your energy. That's all they mean. Do you understand, sir? To gather all your energy to inquire, to find. Right? Would you... Not all the nonsense of temples, rituals, and all this either, sir, what you put on your head. You see how you all agree? The meaning of the word, that means gathering every particle of energy that you have to inquire into what is truth and what is reality, to inquire into what is meditation, to inquire into why human beings live the way we are living, to inquire if there is an end to sorrow, to inquire into what is love, whether one can live without any effort and control all that is implied in that word. A religious life implies being a light to yourself, which means no outside authority. We are talking about having no spiritual authority, including me, the speaker. Have you any authority, spiritual authority? You have had various Guru Mahatma, Mr. Gandhi, and so on, all the way from the 6th, 5th, 4th, 3rd century, down to the present. And where are you having been led for this? thousands years, where are you? Are you 
want to be still led? So I'm asking, we are asking you courteously, if you have thrown away your traditions. Traditions being nationality, your caste, your beliefs, your mm, rituals, going to the temples, all that. Have you thrown it away? No? No. Then how, how can you find out what a religious life is when you are blind? So you want to find out what a religious life is and yet won't leave your little enclosure. Right? You are tied to your tradition and you want to inquire into something that demands a mind that is capable, a heart that can really love. Without that, freeing yourself from your tradition, your culture, your belief, how can you find out anything? You can repeat what the Gita said or the Upanishads or some other book. What value has it? I was told the other day some of the gurus now give lectures or talks on Gita. Is that right? Yes. yes. And there are hundreds and thousands go and listen to it. What value has it? What are we all playing at, sirs? Apparently one doesn't see one's own tragedy. Right, sir? Psychologically, why should I accept what somebody else says? when I realize that I am the rest of mankind. <laughs> the mankind is me. The me is the history of mankind, the book of mankind. If I know how to read it, I don't depend on anybody. So can I, without distortion, without prejudice, without choice, be aware of the content of, of this book, which is me, to read it very carefully, never distorting it, requires a great deal of attention, a great deal of energy, intensity, immediacy, and we are not willing to do all that because it's, we think that is too tiresome. Tell me quickly what to do and I will do it, or I may not do it. Generally, I may not do it. And I personally think that uh, the psychological guidance by another, whether it is the religious guidance or the psychological psychology, the guidance of the psychologists, is totally wrong by father, because then the, you are all you are making humanity to children who have to be guided, told, encouraged. Uh, we are grown-up human beings after five or ten million years. I wouldn't presume to make a statement of what the essence of the teachings is, but I can only imagine that because Krishnaji did live what he was talking about, that what he was talking about was the quality of his living. And that, from what I could see, would be impossible to put into words. But it did have to do with affection. It had to do with 
a deep sense of beauty and that somehow beauty and, and this affection and this attention that he had were somehow related to something that was sacred. And he saw this as something that not just he could live, but that other people could live too. Krishnamurti's teachings are for, to me, a future generation. We are privileged to be in the uh, forefront of the whole thing. But to me, they're, they're imperishable because they cannot be destroyed. They're not rooted in belief, which can be destroyed. But being able to eliminate belief uh, is one of the main objects of the interest in Krishnamurti. Uh, this uh, conditioning around the um, self-centered thought is really an enslavement, an enslavement to absurdity, to destruction, to unhappiness, sorrow, and uh, no other kind of freedom means anything unless we are free from that. <laughs> and therefore I think that he felt that once man was free from that, then the room would be, the way would be open to creative uh, unfoldment in all in all sorts of uh, directions. Well, Krishnamurti traveled almost annually a, a world orbit and lived would live typically for several months in different countries, named India, the United States, and England, and Europe. And he would he maintained uh, over his life long, long term relationships. So there was. Despite this incessant travel, there was, there was continuity. And he had close relationships from early days with the top people in, uh, in the various governments of the world, in India and in England and so on, as well as, uh, as contacts with very humble people. So he was in a position that perhaps has, been, has never been possible before in, history of, uh, through this incessant travel, to have a sense of the unity of the world as well as its diversity. It has been said that Krishnamurti began where Buddha ended. Buddha is supposed to have brought rationality into spirituality. Krishnamurti goes beyond and he shows us the limitations of thought as a means of psychological mutation. And he shows that pure perception, which is not related to time or to thought, acts. And that perception which acts, that breaks away the pattern of the brain, in which human being has been caught over a million years. We are asking, is it possible to bring about a fundamental psychological revolution, deep, abiding, irrevocable change, transformation. One has lived as a limited, contained, narrow individual, and it is very, very difficult to see the truth that you are the rest of mankind, that in you is the whole of man. That is, you as a human being is part of the world. You are the world, not an idea, not something that intellectually has been put together by reason and you say, yes, quite right, but the reality of the truth of it, that you represent as a human being the rest of humanity. Because you suffer, you are anxious, 
You're uncertain, confused, miserable, fearful, hurt, everything. And every human being has this. So your consciousness is the consciousness of mankind. Now is this possible for sorrow to end? If there is the ending of sorrow in one human being, who is the representative of all humanity, that ending affects the whole of consciousness of man. Don't accept what we are talking about. Find out, test it. That means you have to be free to observe. To observe without any wish, any longing, any pressure, any, you know, to observe that is you observe a lovely flower. I wonder why human beings throughout the world don't see this simple fact that you cannot possibly have peace on earth if you are nationalistically divided. We want order outside, in the world, politically, religiously, economically, socially. In our relationship with each other, we want order, we want some peace, we want some understanding. And you, if the inward psychological state is not orderly, not conflicting, not contradicting, if that state in consciousness is quiet, steady, clear, then you can bring about order in the world. Now what we are trying to do is try to bring order legislatively, nationally and so on, order out there in the world which has been proved over and over again that totally brings about disorder. That's why we are saying, and speaker, I'm saying, that without inward order, that is, inward order in consciousness, which is in a mess, which is in a contradiction, without bringing about order inwardly, psychologically, you cannot possibly have order outwardly. And the crisis is there. We have all, within the crisis, national, economic, social and so on. The crisis is not out there. The crisis is really inward. And we are unwilling to face that. He lived it. I mean, by the care and attention that he gave to everything and the depth of his passion and his affection and love for mankind. Yes, I think it did have an impact. You felt leavened by his presence. I mean, you couldn't just... Everybody noticed him the moment he came in a room, you couldn't help it. He carried a quality with him that was rare and, and strong. When he came into a room, there was a light that came into the room, and uh, just to be in his presence was like a cool breeze on a hot day. I mean, there was something absolutely beneficial about being near him, and it was his degree of affection that he had for people and his interest in people and his interest in our being something more than we had set for ourselves. Something took place. There was as if the room awoke And 
and then light entered into him, which was not imagined. And when I said in the, my book that he appeared to grow in size, it was a feeling that he filled the room. that there was nothing else but that which was there. Are we aware of our responsibility to another? If one has a family, wife, children, are you responsible for those children? That you care that you have love for them? Are you concerned that they become healthy, good citizens? If you have children, do you feel responsible for those children? To see that they have right education so that they won't be killed in a war? They won't become mediocre, or you have no time at all for them, because you have to go out and earn money as the man and the mother and the father, as they do now, and have very little time for the children. That's a fact. So where is your responsibility? You are not interested in all this. So one asks, what are you interested in? I think that is a legitimate question. You can talk about love, freedom and, and the beauty of the sky, but there is only outside interest. But basically, what are we interested in? That's right. You are interested in yourself, right? But it's perfectly right. Each one is interested in himself. On that, our society, culture, religion is based, right? Each one interested in himself, his progress, his expert in all the rest of it. Do you, as a human being, realize that we are all one, basically? Not as an idea, but as a fact. Because when you go to India, you see the misery, the confusion, the anxiety, the despair of people running to their pretty little gods whom they have created. They, you come to Europe, it's exactly the same thing. They have God, they are Jesus, they are Christ, they are wrong, you follow? You come here, it's exactly the same. You understand, sir? First, to realize, not verbally, but in your heart, in your blood, in your whole thinking, that human beings right through the world go through the same agonies that one goes through. The loneliness, the despair, the depressions, the extraordinary uncertainty, insecurity, whether they live 10,000 miles away or 2,000 miles or here, they are all psychologically bound together. If one realizes that profoundly in your guts, in your blood, in your heart, in your mind, then you are responsible.
You've heard all this, you as a human being. Why don't you change? What prevents you? If each one of us asked that question, not verbally or merely intellectually as an entertainment, but ask that question most seriously and deeply, what's your answer? What's your answer to this problem that human beings have lived this way for millennia upon millennia? Why haven't they changed? Why haven't you, who are, the, who are listening now, why haven't you changed? You know, if you don't change, what the consequences are? You'll be national, nationalistic, you'll be tribal, insular, isolated, and therefore having no relationship globally, fighting, 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 building up more and more armaments, destroy each other. Now, why don't you, if you are at all serious in this matter, why don't you ask yourself that question? Why am I a human being who has been through all this? Why haven't I changed? What would be your answer? After all, life is one, one global unitary movement. So, in the same way, our consciousness is common to all mankind. Now, if I radically change, Surely it affects the rest of the consciousness of man. Now, why don't you change?